This is yesterday, 2.40 p.m. Funny thing, last night we heard a gentle thump outside. It sounded like someone had thrown a baseball glove against the house. This morning, there was a shiny silver fish, nine inches, a bit away from the front steps. He was missing his head, sadly, probably dropped by one of the osprey living on the cell tower. End of message. And I just said, you know, like, oh, what? That's so crazy. Did you take pictures? And she says, nope, John picked up headless Harry and put him in a bag I held out for him. <laughs> the osprey... <laughs> The osprey are all around us. So beautiful. <laughs> oh, that's great. Patience is a virtue. Not right now it isn't. Nothing says romance like a gift of a kidnapped, injured woman. Life finds a way. So pretty much touch anything and get your head chopped off. I hereby christen this budget Barbie camper Priscilla, queen of the desert. Mason, I am so excited for today's episode. Oh, yeah? Yes. I am super stoked. Hey, hey, hang on. Just, like, really quickly. Before we start. What? Who is this person that's in the call? The person in the banana costume? Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't want to be mean and say anything, but... Like, why is there someone else here when there never has been before? Yeah, I'm like, I mean, hi, um... Did we... This is our very first guest. Oh! Did you forget? Oh, is this Rachel? This is Rachel! <laughs> this is Rachel Vaughn, one of my very best friends who is a massive fan of the movie that we're doing today. And in fact, the person who introduced me to this movie. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rachel, thank you for joining us today. You know what? Do you want to tell us what movie we're doing? We will be talking about Big Trouble in Little China <laughs> and also watching it as it happens. As it happens. <laughs> oh man, I am so excited about this movie. So you were the person who introduced me to this film. I was kind of completely blown away because there is sort of nothing like it. It's insane. Much like our friendship. Yes, thank yeah. you. Mason, have you seen it? I have. And it's been a little while, but I did watch the trailer to kind of remind myself of what was going to be happening. And boy, is it interesting. I am very excited to rewatch this movie because I have very distinct memories of it. And they're very broad strokes type memories. Mm -hmm. And I don't really remember all of the finer details of the movie and how the plot itself moves forward. But yeah, yeah. it's going to be fun for sure. I'm kind of in a similar position where I have like specific images really that jump out. And I'm kind of like, how mm -hmm. did we get from here to there? But we have definitely an expert on the call. I know, Rachel, that this has been a lifelong favorite. How old were you when you first saw it, do you think? You know, I don't know. I discovered it in my parents' cache of VHS tapes. And this was after VHS tapes had sort of been replaced by DVDs. You know, we, of course, still had a VHS player because slow to adopt <laughs> any new tech. Yeah. Our parents <laughs> or, like, give up anything ancient. So I remember finding it, like, as a kid, probably in the 90s. I know the movie was made in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And it was recorded off television <laughs> <laughs> on the same VHS tape as Labyrinth. I oh, say. man. What a back to back yeah, double feature. Sure. It is, yeah. Sort of a blockbuster, but as much as I loathe Labyrinth in like every corner of my tiny, shriveled, <laughs> blackened heart, I love Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny that you had such, I don't know, like a binary reaction to them. Though I will say, and you know, I'm sure that we're going to get some pushback on this. I also have a not love of Labyrinth. I mean, for me, like, it's any sort of Jim Henson thing. Like, I don't like puppets. I don't like Muppets. Mm. I've hated them since I was a child. It's Sesame Street. I've resented since I was a toddler because, I mean, one, they're weird. Two, I knew there were human beings there and they wouldn't let me talk to them. <laughs> okay, so you have these puppets teaching me the alphabet, but out of order. <laughs> I was just enough of this tiny bastard even then to hate it and to resent them for, like, presuming to teach me. I'm like, you're a bird. I'm a person and I know the alphabet. <laughs> I just can imagine you facing Jim Henson and being like, how dare you put this artificial barrier between me and these people? <laughs> I want to learn the alphabet directly. Is this an insult? Who is this count? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I do like the Muppets. And Muppet Treasure Island is one of my favorites. And Muppet Christmas Carol is one of my favorites. What I can't handle, though, there are some of his puppets that I can't do. The Dark Crystal ones freak me all the way out. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I've weird. heard of that. Yeah, like a lot of people are creeped out by them. Yeah. Uh-uh. Creep, like, 
too realistic or puppets that have like facial features that are trying to be human or I don't know. I just, mm, mm-hmm. uh-uh. So I can kind of get I it. I can identify though with the Christmas Carol and Muppet Treasure Island because those have also great performances from people we love in the human yeah. role because every Muppets film has the token human, which I think is kind of funny, mm-hmm. but Tim Curry mm-hmm. or... Muppet Treasure Island. I mean, not just puppets, but you know, like... David Bowie's unrestrained wiener and his pair of jodhpurs yeah, wandering around. fair enough. That's also true. <laughs> Very true. And then just like, she's so young. Any movie where it's unknown adults or possibly eternal witch kings or goblin kings or whatever the hell mm-hmm. he is in that, she's just so young. She's so young. It feels like straight up grooming, you know, and... Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter if you turn into an owl, you're still a pervert. Yeah. Yep. That's a great title for an episode. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of long. If you could like tighten up your little quips, that would be great. So we could use them as episode titles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is such a funny pair of movies to be together on a VHS tape, though. Mm-hmm. Our uncle did a lot of taping from TV. So we also had a lot of TV taped things in our house. He was kind of a hoarder. And in his house when we were kids, he would just have stacks of VHS tapes of things that he had recorded off of TV. I mean, I remember mm. specifically... I don't know why this, but for some reason, he had taped a TV movie. This sounds like a porn, but it was a TV movie called Au Pair 2 that I remember receiving a VHS (laughs) copy of and being like, why would, (laughs) why? We didn't see Au Pair 1. I don't know what this is. (laughs) (laughs) Did it have commercials and stuff in it? Not that I remember, but I mean, it was a while ago. So I mean, like, I might have just been so enthralled that I wasn't paying attention to any commercials for like Skippets or Pogo Balls (laughs) or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, like, among the other stacks, we had things like Rainbow Bright and, like, oh, yeah. Jumping Jack Flash, <laughs> which I also really love. Oh, man. The movies that you loved as a kid, it's so interesting because sometimes it's very commercially driven. I feel like some people, it was like their parents mm-hmm. got every Disney movie, so, of course, it was whatever was being really heavily marketed. And then other people, it's, why did we have a copy of this in our house, and now it is my favorite film? Yeah. You know, and we had a lot of weird, weird shit in our yeah. house mm-hmm. as well. Things that were wildly inappropriate for our age group as well and that we saw way 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 too early i'm sure and traumatized us to the point where (laughs) therapy didn't work and we had to make a podcast yeah exactly (laughs) the only movie that i remember watching that truly traumatized me as a child was my mom wanted to make sure that i understood how babies were made and went to the oh yeah (laughs) i remember you telling me (laughs) so she went to the public (laughs) library and she rented like a educational film that was called something like the miracle of birth yep that is a very famous video is it okay yes it is or infamous maybe (laughs) yeah infamous is right so i think she thought you know this is a challenging enough topic i'm gonna try to make it fun and kind of like a sleepover so she put down like a foam mattressy thing on the floor and then like put down some blankets and she was like okay we're gonna watch this together you know mother daughter we're gonna talk about and then she got a phone call So I am out there just laying on my stomach with my little feet kicking like I'm going to watch a cute movie and then just alone watched a human birth. Mm. Yeah. And I was just like, no, no. (laughs) By the way, that is the most mom thing to do to just like start watching a movie and two to three minutes in, take a phone call, walk away. Don't come back for the rest of the movie. That is a very mom thing. It must have been something important because it's not like she would have just left me there watching a baby emerge from a woman, I don't think. Unless she didn't know what the movie actually had in it. Or how quickly that... I mean, maybe she just didn't... I don't know. I don't know. Right. I mean, she might have also discovered a headless fish out yeah, there. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Good point. <laughs> that takes precedence. <laughs> Absolutely. I heard a thump on the house. It sounded like a baseball glove hitting, so I left my child in there watching, <laughs> you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, that would be... I mean, the real miracle of birth is that ospreys are all around. (laughs) (laughs) So beautiful! (laughs) I assume, by the way, that Emily has told you that this is not our mom's first brush with birds, and that we... (laughs) (laughs) It's not her first brush I don't know where that one was going. She has has previously (laughs) met a bird. (laughs) When we were going to and from the tree farm that she inherited from her dad, at one point we saw the aftermath of a fight between an owl and a hawk. Mm -hmm. And so there were feathers everywhere. And it just so happened that there was also a foot, like a foot had been left behind. And our mom really 
thought she that this was a special it. thing. Yeah. And so she took this taloned claw, severed above the kind of wrist bird joint. Bird ankle? Bird ankle, I sure. Don't know what... And then saved it for decades. <laughs> Is it still there? I don't think it's still there. It, it actually might be. It might be in the downstairs freezer. Yeah. So it stayed in our freezer, wrapped <laughs> around a multicolored bean bag. Hacky sack. Ball thing. Hacky sack. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For decades. I'm not making this up. Decades. <laughs> That's your inheritance now. That's our inheritance, yeah. We're going to inherit <laughs> a bunch of old books and the foot of a hawk. Yep. Yep. I mean, is it confirmed the hawk? It wasn't the it owl? It might have been the owl. I actually, I don't know. No, we looked it up. Oh, we, okay. We definitely looked it up. I'm pretty sure we know that it was a hawk. And the reason that we know that it was a fight with an owl is because... There was a dead owl on the ground. The, the feathers. <laughs> no, there was enough evidence that we could tell what had happened... And then, you know, we were able to discern From whose foot this a was. a claw shape or something. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Get fucked, Hawk. <laughs> I hope that owl's still out there. Yeah. Just murdering things. I know, right? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. Ten like decades that. later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still out there. <laughs> He's running a criminal empire. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I learned some lessons from that, Anne Winsour. <laughs> it, yeah. So we're way, way far off. I feel <laughs> a moral obligation to bring us back to the movie that we're going to be watching today. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Rachel, when you first Mm -hmm. saw this in the 90s, what -hmm. was it that made it stick with you so much? And I know you had this intense reaction from it, even from the start. What was it Mm -hmm. that did that, that incited this love? You could say this about a lot of movies, I suppose, but I'm like, it has everything. It's got magic. It's got some eternal battle between people who have nothing to do with you. Human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Really cool fashion. Kim Cattrall shitting all over Kurt Mm -hmm. Russell. Mm Mm-hmm. It has James Hong in it. Amazing. You know, like everything. I mean, it just appealed to everything in little tiny Rachel's idea of what is exciting and what would be fun and interesting to do, yeah. apart from the human trafficking, really. Yeah. But I think what it was for me was just that it was funny, you know, it was witty. There's a dress in it that one of the main characters wear that I imprinted <laughs> on that was, in my mind, for years, was the most beautiful dress I'd ever seen in my life. And it's really not. Like, it's essentially a caftan. I don't know why. <laughs> like, I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> and I think... One of the things that I like most about it, too, is that it's... I mean, I'm assuming most of it wasn't actually set in actual Chinatown, but the location is so important. The culture Mm -hmm. is so important, even if it's sort of played as a joke a lot of the time. But it also... It shows you these characters, you know, who are white, you know, in Chinatown, kind of navigating these cultural differences and being a part of it and being outside of it, but still being entirely fully involved in, like, whatever adventure is going down. And so... They're kind of always at a loss, even in the middle of a fight, (laughs) even when they're running for their asses or trying to save somebody else's life. There's still that space between who they are and what they're experiencing and how the Chinese characters around them are experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't know, like, I mean, I just feel like it's interesting not being Chinese or Chinese American. Like, I can't actually speak to that, but it's similar in a lot of ways to having grown up Asian American in America and that sort of age old struggle of not feeling like you necessarily belong anywhere. Like you're not Asian enough or you're not white enough, but still, (laughs) it's not like you can separate yourself from the environment you grow up in. And so I feel like it's just always interesting to me to see people navigate their way through these spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And happy Asian American Pacific Islander Month, by the way. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) We were talking about this. So obviously we did a little bit of prep just for the episode because, you know, we've never had a guest before. So obviously we told her kind of the drill. (laughs) And it was funny because I realized during that call that, oh, yeah, hey, it's Asian American Pacific Islander Month. And we're doing Crouching Tiger and then Big Trouble in Little China back to back, which is completely a coincidence. And it's, hey, some fun, bizarre choices to have made for celebrating this holiday. (laughs) Indeed. Mm -hmm. But I do want to say that one of the things that you brought up that it has the combination of all these things is why we feel like we can dedicate an entire podcast to adventure movies, which oftentimes blend all of these Mm -hmm. things that we love in a really sometimes artful, sometimes funny, sometimes emotional ways. But yeah, I love that there's always a range to adventure movies, you know, that Mm -hmm. you get a little bit of everything. Yeah. And then to the second point, seeing somebody tried to navigate their way through a different culture and there's also room for them to not have a perfect interaction and like a perfect response Mm -hmm. and that they're kind of sometimes fumbling through it but that there's grace for that and like understanding and some humor to it as well that's also a fun element for me Mm -hmm. it has been a couple years since i've seen this but i remember liking that about kim cattrall's character because she's a journalist that's pretty deeply 
connected within isn't that right or am i thinking about a different movie she's a lawyer she's a lawyer yeah her friend is the journalist oh okay thank you yeah but she like lives in that area right Mm -hmm. because i remember being like oh that's cool yeah because i guess part of it appeals to i enjoy traveling when you're traveling in another country where you don't speak the language or there's some kind of major cultural barrier it takes a lot to sort of be like i'm going to put my whole self out there and just dive on into this and I'm going to make some mistakes, but you can do that. And I think that's a part of what I enjoy about these types of characters in these types of scenarios is just like pretty much exactly what you said. You can dive in and make your way and you're not always going to feel like you've done everything perfectly or like it's super smooth, but you know, it makes you think like, yeah, you know, sure. I can move to Chinatown and be a super badass and make friends with all these people and learn new languages and learn new cultures and dishes and ways of doing things. In the first half of the movie, I think at some point, this will come up later, but after Jack has lost his truck and Gracie Law comes into the restaurant and he's like, what are you doing here? And she's like, this is my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the idea that she's still an outsider there, but sort of an accepted one Mm -hmm. and an expected one in a way too. And and her role there, why she was there in the beginning was to champion the human rights of this other woman who'd flown in from China that she was trying to protect. And sort of like a nice little character note for her that she's not just some gentrifying white lady opening up a cupcake shop. (laughs) She's actually there doing the work and making herself part of the community as far as she can, you know, without trying to take over something, which is nice. And it's nice that you can be a part of a community without being the same as everybody in the community, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a great thing to see any way you cut it, really. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'm really interested in watching for this time is the influence of John Carpenter, who Mm. I didn't really realize was the hand behind things like Halloween, The Fog, The Thing, Escape from New York, kind of horror, thriller classics. And to do this research and see him come up as like this master of horror, I've never watched this movie thinking Mm. that that was the director's background. And now some of the things that I remember, some of those like really intense scenes, we're not going to get too much into the plot, but demons and Mm -hmm. some really intense characters and costumes and makeup, it really does lend itself to somebody that's really well-versed in horror and also the art of bringing things to life in film that elicit a very visceral response or are very visually striking I can really now I think appreciate that more or Mm -hmm. will attempt to appreciate that more on this watch through you know one thing that I was thinking Rachel when you were talking about like why it appealed to you so much as a kid and it kind of touches on some of the things you said but it's also just a really colorful movie Mm -hmm. and I feel like when you're a kid or at least for me when I was a kid I was like super into oh this is so cool like you know so I feel like that would be kind of a part of what could drive that too yeah, yeah, like it moves along quickly. There's always action. There's something bright or interesting or beautiful to look at throughout. Yes. Which works just as well for little Rachel as it does for adult Rachel. I don't have a lot of attention span. I'm like, you know, sort of <laughs> monochromatic. Yeah. <laughs> Sad, slow movies don't do it for me at all. So, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> the tracks. Honestly, yeah. Like, I'm kind of still the same way as well. Like, we were talking about this with, oh gosh, it was Hunt for Wilder People, where it's kind of a short movie. It's only about 100 minutes long. And I was like, I like these. Like, short movies are great. <laughs> because <laughs> I can't focus on anything. Yep, and I did peek at the runtime of this movie, and it's around the same 90, 100 minute mark. Awesome. So mm-hmm. the action continues throughout, and by the end, it's not like you're exhausted by the fact that you've had to kind of like keep track or keep pace with the movie. It ends at the right time, and it knows its length and its audience and everything. So Also, mm-hmm. we haven't talked much about Kurt Russell, but I do remember him being super fun to watch in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, young Kurt Russell is a whole vibe. Yeah, yeah. He's got his fluffy hair and he's got his little tank top mm-hmm. and he has an attitude that's really fun. I mean, I could watch more of these. I remember when we watched it the first time in Seattle, I think I floated the idea of us dressing up as different Jack Burtons for <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. I forgot. <laughs> oh, tank tops, tight jeans, trucker mm-hmm. hat. Yes. Smeared lipstick. Smeared. <laughs> what else do you want? Yeah. Nothing. 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 So obviously this movie is one that stands out to you as a favorite. But like, are there other adventure movies that are among your favorites? How do you feel too about just kind of the genre generally? And that's two questions. That's enough questions. I don't need to tack on a third one. <laughs> I don't know, honestly, that I've thought of adventure movies separately. 
from other movies. And I mean, and I get like that it makes sense, you know, and it's something that naturally like you think like, yeah, an adventure movie. But I think of a lot of things as being adventurous. And so I <laughs> just sort of like, yeah, cool. It can be like some sort of weird sci-fi mm -hmm. dystopian film. I'm like, that's an adventure in the future. Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. But kind of similar. I mean, not similar, but it's also a martial arts movie. You've done Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, but Hero Ugh. with Jet Li. I love that movie. Of mine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> Visually insanely beautiful. Like so many breathtaking landscapes that they use. And yeah, like Hero, I guess. Does Mad Max count? Sure. Why not, man? I mean, I think our <laughs> philosophy would be very similar to what you said, which is just like adventure is kind of a secondary genre. Why you got to put a box on adventure, Emily? You're I such a know, square. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all I'm saying, though, like, is I think our general philosophy is that adventure is something that happens in addition to other stuff. There mm -hmm. are very few movies that the only genre would be adventure. Yeah. So, I mean, we honestly probably have pushed the boundaries of what could be considered adventure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think we're probably fine with that. I do want to clarify really quickly <laughs> the Mad Max that we're talking about. Is this the Mel Gibson Mad Max or is this the Tom Hardy Charlize Theron Mad Max? I mean, I feel like they both have their charms. Okay. But the one I remember most is the Tom Hardy one, because that's the one I watched most recently. Oh, yeah. But very, you know, an imaginary place, I guess, but very solid, real sense of place that in that it's its own character yeah. in its way. Like it's something yeah. that they've got to sort of contend against, something they've got to fight against, in addition to the freak show cannibal people who <laughs> are trying to <laughs> kill them and or yep. breed them, I guess. Ugh, yeah. <laughs> Other distance. I've forgotten about that part. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That movie is so good, though. I loved Fury it Road. Was. But, like, Mason, you saw his face light up a little bit there because he loves this sort of location as character thing, mm -hmm. you know, and that's definitely one of the themes of the movies we've done this season. I think for me, a lot of it's having an externally driven plot. Any real story should probably have an element of some kind of internal journey or internal evolution. But with adventure movies, it's usually something external driving the plot. You know, it's being thrown into circumstances you didn't expect or something. Like that. Oh, but I just thought of one. I don't know if it counts. Oh. <laughs> You're talking about, you know, in terms of location or the setting being just like a driving factor as well. I don't I never feel like anyone actually talks about this movie, but what dreams may come. Do you guys remember oh, that? No. Robin I Williams. Do, but it's been... He ends up, you know, in the afterlife or whatever. But the form it takes is as like one of his wife's paintings until um, he goes through whatever journey he goes through in the afterlife with Cuba Gooding Jr. Um, and <laughs> then the setting sort of solidifies itself. But I figure it counts as an adventure movie. Interesting. Also really visually beautiful and different. Like, I don't know that I've seen yeah. anything else that's like that. Hmm. I'm writing it down because I wouldn't have thought of that. But gosh, it's been many years. But mm -hmm. I do really love those movies that construct a new place mm -hmm. for you to kind of follow a story in. I feel like my favorite probably, it's a different tone for sure than what dreams may come but inception i really yeah, yeah. love that about inception the going inward and constructing a new world and the layers deep in all of that it's mm -hmm. just fascinating and i don't know if we could call that an adventure movie but if we could that'd be a fun an episode. adventure of the mind so mason do you want to be the one who's like why don't we spin this energy into watching a movie or something <laughs> sure uh let me think <laughs> of how to do that <laughs> i'll do it Rachel will do it. You sons of bitches, let's watch this movie. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're right. It's time. The time has come to watch Big Trouble in Little China. This is Jack Burton in the Pork Chop Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening out there. It's a pretty amazing planet we live on here, and a man would have to be some kind of fool to think we're all alone in this universe. There is a hidden world where ancient evil weaves a modern mystery. What's going on here? Is this some kind of... Magic. The darkest magic. They call it Little China. Finally, we shall bring order out of chaos. It's where big trouble was waiting for Jack Burton. Who? Jack Burton. Me. Jack. Jack. Jack! They told him to go to hell. He make one move. Jack! And that's just where he's going. Somebody, I don't care who, tell me what is going on. How are you going to spring us? I have no idea. There are many mysteries, many unanswerable questions, even in a life as short as yours. My destiny rests in your capable hands. Hey, I'll do my best. Oh, God, is this really happening? This is going to take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. One, two, three. We may be trapped. Total concentration. Safety. Oh, uh, yeah. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. Way to go, Jack. 
Jack Burton's coming to rescue your summer. Hey, what more can a guy ask for? 20th Century Fox presents Kurt Russell in John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. It's all in the reflexes. Oh, goodness, guys. We're back from watching Big Trouble in Little China. We are. A movie, as Rachel said, that was not meant for subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> Going into it, I felt like it was maybe a bit overacted, but then as we were watching it, it was fun and exciting and, yeah, definitely not the place to have small emotions. Everything was big and exciting and lightning. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think overacted in some points is fair, but I also think that kind of like Rachel pointed out, who cares? This is a fun movie, you know? Yep. Yeah, I mean, is it Kim Cattrall's greatest acting role? No. Is she fun (laughs) and enjoyable to watch and a memorable character in it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, John Carpenter films, I mean, are they known for their nuance, (laughs) really? No. (laughs) No, definitely not. You know, and there is nothing, I think possibly literally nothing nuanced about this movie. Mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite things is Jack's just intense accent. He seems like he's doing an impression the whole time. But the funny thing is, I noticed some stuff going through this screenplay. Obviously, things change between the screenplay and the movie as it is shot. But there's like a whole dialogue back and forth with radio caller, radio host that's not in the movie and a bunch of interesting Hmm. stuff like that. You know what? I'm going to start and ask Rachel, like, you have seen this movie so many times. Is there anything that jumped out to you, especially on this watch? I mean, nothing that I haven't noticed before on hundreds and hundreds of viewings. But I also have a tidbit that I'm hoping neither of you caught. (gasps) Go for it. But I will wait until later. (laughs) I'm I'm curious because I have watched it another two times (laughs) since we... (laughs) Since we watched it together, okay. and I did pick up on some more stuff as I went through it in the second and third pass, and a lot of them have to do with David Lopin and the fact that he shows up in different places and in different forms than mm-hmm. is exactly laid out in the movie, mm-hmm. or in the lore of the movie. And so I'm curious if that may be where you're thinking. I don't know. Mine is a wardrobe thing. Oh, Ooh. it's a wardrobe thing. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, not a surprise penis like in the mummy. <laughs> I'm hoping it'll still be fascinating. Okay. That's a thing I can Google too. It's like, oh, actually, so no surprise penises, thankfully. Though I did notice as I was writing the plot summary that there is a particular semantic challenge in talking about this movie. And it is that our two main characters are Jack and Wang. And when you are writing, you are frequently referring to Jack and Wang or Wang and Jack. And I many times had to choose how to phrase that. And essentially, if you're reading quickly, that means that when you're, for example, reviewing your plot summary, you're often talking about Jack and Wang or Wang and Jack. And I did try to avoid Jack and Wang as much as possible. I mean, there should always be a healthy amount of Jack and Wang. (laughs) I mean, honestly, like, I didn't get it until I was like, wow, okay, I'll switch it up a little bit because I'm always saying Jack and Wang. And then I was like, oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I'm sure that I'm not the first person to come across that challenge, but it stuck out. Did it? (laughs) Jack and Wang stuck out. (laughs) Yeah. Speaking of Jack and Wang, I think we all during the watch of the movie, we're very curious about what type of relationship they had before the cameras start rolling, essentially. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. what was it that got them to where they are? What forged their friendship? And then as the movie goes on and we learn more about Wang, it's really interesting to see his prowess martially. You know, he's an incredible martial artist and is really, in many ways, the hero of the movie. And I think that's not like a hot take. That is something that I think is reinforced over and over again as you watch the movie that Jack is there, but (laughs) he's kind of still just along for the ride in many ways. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, like he shoots his gun in the air and rocks fall and he's knocked out for the majority of the fight. Or he throws his knife across the room and has to go retrieve it while Wang kills everybody else. Like all of these things, it's not a secret that he's not the hero, I don't think, but... It really does make me wonder how Wang got those skills and what his training was like, because he does go toe-to-toe with the baddest of the baddies. 
and he's just a restaurant owner, or so we think. Yeah, so, poor Chinese boy, as he calls himself. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. I'm not going to do the accent, but yes. <laughs> Pay up 1148 bucks times two. Yeah, hey, I don't have that kind of money, Jack. Uh, I didn't hear that, Wang. Hey, I'm just a poor Chinese boy, you know? Yeah, you own a restaurant. That's a hell of a lot more than me. One of the things that really stuck out to me is it's like it was written for a character where they thought they were going to make jokes about somebody misusing English idioms, like the we'll be dead doornails and the nothing or double. But the thing is, mm -hmm. his English is way too good for that to really play. So the whole time, it just feels like somebody who sort of likes making up his own versions of phrases. <laughs> it never really struck me as a skill thing so much as a... Nothing or double is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Nothing or double. This knife cuts this ball in half. Nothing or double. Bullshit. Nothing or double, Jack. Dennis Dunn? He was a lot of fun in this. I am very curious about, like you said, you know, his background as a character, but also his background as an actor because he had some skills. Absolutely. Also, it's confirmed that he is from California. He was born in Stockton, California, so... <laughs> I want to go look up where Kurt Russell was born, but there's a moment early on where he's like, oh, we're both Californians, right? And it's kind of fun because they probably both are in real mm -hmm. life as well. So we'll check that I out. I thought Kurt Russell was Canadian for some reason. Really? I don't know. Let's find out. I think that mullet just gives big Canadian energy. <laughs> yeah. Actually, he's from Massachusetts. Okay. <laughs> no, he Same was thing. born in Massachusetts and raised in Thousand Oaks, California. So oh. there you go. Actually, he they was. They are California boys. They're both Californians. Yeah. So that kind of makes sense then that I was not picking up much of a Chinese accent on Wang because he's from Stockton. <laughs> so <laughs> I wish it gave us more detail about his martial arts training because he does seem really competent. Speaking of which, our lovely, she's not really a heroine, I guess, but she's the object of Wang's affection, Susie Pai who played Mao Yin, is actually from Ohio and was a Philadelphia Eagles cheerleader, which I think is something that Mason told us during our watch of the movie. Correct. Yeah. I was looking to see at the time whether or not her eyes were naturally green, and they are. It was not contacts, though I think in the case of Kim Cattrall, they did put green contacts to make her eyes even more brilliantly green. But Susie Pye's eyes are naturally green, and she's just an American girl and made her way to Hollywood by way of cheerleading in the NFL, which I thought was pretty neat. Yeah, she didn't stick around for too long, though. I did look up to see if she'd done much after this, and she retired from acting in the 90s and has just been kind of living a quiet life. A lot of stuff we talked about before going into our watch of the movie really rang true. There is so much going on. There's so much color. There's so much set decoration. It's a very fun movie to watch just because there's so much in it. And there's a lot of comedy, of course, and a lot of... <laughs> I forgot about the monsters. I forgot how many monsters there were, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, and that tracks with the comment that I made at the beginning as well, that this is a John Carpenter movie, and I hadn't really thought of it as having horror elements until this watch. And then, yeah, the number of costumes and animatronics and things like that, or visual effects of floating balls of eyes <laughs> <laughs> that were David Lopan's servant searching the tunnels for people. That type of stuff, really, I had completely forgotten. Yeah, there is a lot that I had forgotten. But then again, there's so much to remember, you know? It's complicated. That is very true. Even though it is a shorter runtime movie, there's a lot going on at all times. Mm -hmm. And the progression is pretty quick. There's not a lot of downtime in between action sequences or the group moving from place to place. So it is really difficult, even though, like I said, a short movie, to have a full mental map of everywhere they go, everything they do, all of that. Yeah. It's also what made it difficult to write the plot summary because I was like, God, this is just so long. It's going on and on because just so much happens. And yes. I left out entire characters and plot lines and I still came up with such a long plot summary. Yeah. And it's very visual too. You know, a lot of it in order to explain it thoroughly in a plot summary, you know, you're going to have to go into a lot of random detail. Yep. With that though, do you want to Give us the plot summary. <laughs> yeah, are you guys, what do you think? Any... <laughs> All right, I will. Plot summary. <laughs> I am ready if you guys are, but you might have to brace yourselves. Okay, I am braced. Rachel, are you braced? I'm clenched. You're clenched. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. Okay, everybody comfortable? Cell phone's off, right? Okay, here we go. Jack Burton is a terrible driver. 
He's wearing sunglasses in a rainstorm and doing a stream of consciousness monologue on a CB radio while pounding a $5 footlong heading into downtown San Francisco. Chinatown, to be specific. His 18-wheeler barely fits into the narrow streets and alleys, but he knows his way around and his first stop is for some fresh bow from a street vendor before he meets up with BFF Wang Chi and a bunch of guys for a little gambling action. They play until morning, and Wang is down, but promises to pay Jack back. Not particularly trusting this promise, Jack insists on driving him to get it, but Wang needs to make a stop first. At the airport to pick up his fiancée Mao Yin, a beautiful girl with green eyes who's flying in from China. He might be putting a touch too much pressure on this because he tells Jack that, quote, she's going to put my whole life in order, and that's just not fair to expect of any relationship. (laughs) Yeah. At the airport, Jack spots a pretty lady and goes to talk to her, but she wants no part of it. She's waiting for someone on that flight, too, a Chinese girl named Tara. The passengers are disembarking, and in the chaos, some stylish thugs, those sunglasses, try to grab Tara. (laughs) They lose her in the crowd, but spot Mao Yin and grab her instead. Wang and Jack run after her, but are too late, and see her stuffed into the trunk of a car. They have no idea why she's been taken, but Jack thinks his new crush from the airport might know something. Luckily, Wang knows where to find her. Back in Chinatown, in pursuit of Mao Yin, they end up in an alley and come face to face with a funeral procession. Wang assures Jack that these are the Chang Sings, the good guys, but soon the funeral is crashed by some decidedly not good guys, the Wing Kong, who shoot up the place and pay special attention to the coffin, presumably for dramatic effect. Out of bullets, the two gangs go at it Street Fighter style, while Jack and Wang watch from the truck. In the middle of this, there's a flash of green light, and three intense-looking men in big straw hats descend in thunder, rain, and lightning, which incidentally are also their names. These three chase after the gangs, and Jack takes the opportunity to drive the truck out of the alley. But as he's picking up steam, a creepy-looking old guy in ancient Chinese attire appears in front of the truck. Jack thinks he's hit him and gets out of the truck to check, but Wang tells him that no, this is David Lopan, a dark sorcerer. Jack's disbelief doesn't last long because, sure enough, Lopan pops back up, screeching and shooting beams of light out of his eyes, blinding Jack. Wang leads him out of the alley and then splashes his eyes with dirty alley water to restore his sight and potentially give him a secondary eye infection. They make it back to Wang's restaurant, and Jack is immediately on the phone with his insurance company about his truck. I love the running gag of the truck. Yeah, like Gracie lost his romantic interest, but his real love is the truck. (laughs) Yeah, his real love is the Pork Chop Express. (laughs) The Pork Chop Express. (laughs) <laughs> that's another piece of backstory that i want to know is the backstory of the name like why did you name your truck that the first thing that's offloaded from his truck though is a pig and mm-hmm. i don't know if it has anything to do with the fact that he's transporting animals to be turned yeah. into the food <laughs> i don't know well, that's such a thoughtful way of putting it mason eddie lee the restaurant's new maitre d and a whole, and a whole, lot, more. A whole lot more yes good afternoon mr Wall. Eddie Lee, meet my dear friend Jack Burton. Eddie's a new major d here at the Blackpool. And a whole lot more. When he first comes in, he's wearing his suit jacket. He seems like more than a host-type restaurant employee. It feels like he's dressing for the job he wants, you know? Eddie Lee tells them that the bad guys stole his truck and explains that the thugs from the airport, quote, just wanted a girl to sell and Mao Yin got in the way. <laughs> okay. The back door opens, and a figure comes in from the downpour. It's the woman from the airport, Gracie Law, a human rights lawyer who lives in the neighborhood. She feels guilty that Mao Yen got caught up in this and has come to help. How do we feel, by the way, about Gracie generally? How do you? No, we... You're going to have to tell us. We. How do we, you... Oh, how do we? Yeah. We, We, i.e. you. (laughs) I think she's a fine character. A fine, upstanding woman. Mm -hmm. I would like to see her practice law. (laughs) <laughs> that's my comment i would like to see her practice law like we're, we're her taking a lot practice. on faith that she's a real lawyer kind of like charlie is into bird law <laughs> but i just would like to see her we see her in her office and that's a weird scene mm-hmm. because that was the tell don't show scene where <laughs> two characters are like oh you mean this place which has this reputation is owned by this person and here's why we care about it and here's why it's so dangerous yes that's why, you know, and yeah. that was a weird scene. But I think she's fine. <laughs> so Mason's skeptical about her legal prowess. Rachel, thoughts, mm-hmm. feelings? I'm a fan of Gracie Law, probably even more than Jack. Just because, I mean, she's combative and <laughs> annoying a and wild you know, intrusive <laughs> in her way. But, like, at least her motivations come from somewhere that I feel yeah. like is yeah. much more meaningful. Like, she's not after a truck. She's there to help someone and feels bad that Miao Yin got yeah. caught up yes. in that. And I think even for their dynamic with Jack and Gracie especially, being sort of outsiders in this environment and in this culture, 
it's sort of fun because they're both just sort of just sort of accidenting their way through this rescue and through this attempt at making things yeah. right. And I feel like how Jack is just sort of, you know, he's down for Wang and he's down for the ride. And he's going to help as best he can and ends up not really helping a whole lot at all. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Gracie is the same in that way. I mean, she gets caught up as one of yeah. Lopin's brides, but she sort of holds her own as well. Like you see her scrapping, mm-hmm. you see her kicking a monster in the nuts. Like, oh, yeah, I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. I do like that about her, that her being kind of obnoxious, it all comes from this place of wanting to be a good person. And I feel like with her especially, like you mentioned, you know, with the two of them, they kind of have their different ways of bumblefucking through being a part of this community. And I think Jax is sort of like, I'm going to be here and be cool and be chill and be friends. And I feel like she's like, I'm going to serve, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like she, I'm going to champion you. Exactly. Like, we don't necessarily need that, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the effort. So it could come off as kind of like white savior but it's also, she listens and she learns and takes advice from people and just is there to like put the considerable energy that she has into doing whatever seems to be right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like she's trying to bend her Karen levels of ferocity, like <laughs> yes. towards. The yeah, thing. exactly. <laughs> like I like that. She's a Karen for good. And like we said during the watch, she has also made this community her home, and it would feel more white savory if she was coming in from mm-hmm. Manhattan, you know, or something. Like I've flown mm-hmm. in to save you all, or whatever. But no, this is her community, and of course she's invested in protecting it, and she just also happens to be white. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, if she were patronizing at all, then maybe. But, you know, she's just sort of listening to Uncle Chu and Nick Shen talk mm-hmm. about, like, demons and things like that. And she's like, okay, <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. guess we're going with it. <laughs> so, like, I get where you're coming from, definitely, Mason. There's some stuff about the performance that I could quibble with, but there's also something kind of viscerally appealing to me about her and her just, I think ferocity is a good word, you know, just ferocity of trying to do the right thing and their human rights are going to be protected. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm going to protect their human rights, and I don't care whose human rights I don't protect to get it. (laughs) (laughs) I think she's just kind of an endearing character. But I will say, I really love Jack. For some reason, his sort of laissez-faire attitude toward everything, and just kind of rolling in and being... I don't know why, but just the fact that his first stop is, I'm going to get some buns. Mm -hmm. Like, he goes right for the bow, and that's very relatable to me. After just finishing his $5 foot long as well, Mm -hmm. he's like... (laughs) still hungry i could still eat i could eat i could eat and i'm back here so and we wonder during the movie where is home for him and i don't know if san francisco specifically is home but he's talking to wang and he refers to them both as california boys so he's Mm -hmm. clearly from somewhere i feel like jack's definitely from like modesto or fresno or something (laughs) (laughs) yeah i just mostly would love to know more about the backstory of all of these people maybe it's because they are all such unique strong very clearly defined characters And they've been thrown into this insane circumstance that I think it's that that makes me want to know, like, where did you all come from? How did this all happen? (laughs) Tell me everything. I would kickstart a Big Trouble in Little China prequel. Oh, yeah. We would have to figure out the name for it. It would have to also be funny. Little Trouble in Big Modesto? Yeah. Small Trouble in Larger China? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I know I have completely gotten off track from the summary. We'll get back to it. But it's actually not a bad thing because this is a long one. But... So, you know, like at the beginning, of course, there's the title card. And then on the title card says Big Trouble, Little China. And then there are a bunch of Chinese characters in the middle. So that actually translates to evil spirits make a big scene in little spiritual state. Nice. I'd say that's accurate. Yeah. (laughs) I think so, too. (laughs) That's what happened. (laughs) That is what what happens. Yeah. So anyway, okay, where were we? Luckily, Gracie knows where they will have taken Miao Yin. And they hatch a plan to try to buy her back from the people who stole her, with Jack as their creepy white guy shill. Cut to the inside of the brothel, with Jack absolutely selling it in a 1970s suit, thick glasses, and a strong Midwestern accent. He drops hints that he'd love a girl with green eyes, and a suspicious madam slips off to check on Mao Yin, who is tied up in a hidden room. While the rest of the group waits outside, Gracie runs over to another car. She has called her friend Margot, a journalist who is looking for her big break on a sex trafficking story. Back inside, Jack is in a room with a girl and trying to ask discreet questions. They're interrupted by what seems like an earthquake at first, until a bright green light appears over the building and the three storms come in and take Miao Yin. Back at Gracie's office slash apartment, the group is strategizing. 
Wang thinks that Miao Yin has been taken to the Wing Kong Exchange, which Gracie helpfully points out is the most dangerous cutthroat den of madmen in Chinatown, so naturally Jack wants to go with him to help out. They go in pretending to be the phone company, with Jack carrying a rotary phone as proof. That's one of my favorite details in this movie. He's like, we're going to be the phone company. And then it's got the cords and everything, like he ripped it out of the wall. Was it actually the phone company that they were trying to be? Yes. I rewatched it today. They said to the guards at the front that they were there with the phone company. Wow, I love working Whoa. nights. Wait, don't get up. Don't get up. Hold on. Phone All right, boys, where's the main panel at? Probably through here, huh? Go ahead, go ahead, give me one. Oh, okay. I knew that they were looking for an access panel, but I guess I didn't hear them say that they were phone company. Mm -hmm. But okay, that makes more sense to why they just let them pass. Because as I was watching it the first time, I was like, why are these guards so unfazed by this intrusion? It makes very little sense. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, they try to bust in just based on the fact that he's carrying a phone and with the force of their personality. Yep. But then they keep up the ruse as they go through the hallway and they notice yes. a camera. And they're it, like, yeah. uh, finding the box to put the cords. Good work, Jack. I think they actually fell for it. Yeah. Well, last time we had this problem was on account of some squirrels chewing through the wires. Remember that? Yeah. I better locate that central junction box. I think it's right down there. Yeah. Meanwhile, back at the restaurant, the rest of the group has summoned Egg Shen, a tour bus owner-operator and local authority on Lopan. He tells them in addition to being the chairman of a bank and prolific businessman, Lo Pan is basically an immortal ghost demon. At the exchange, Wang and Jack find a secret elevator hidden behind some boxes and take it down, but it turns out to be a trap. The elevator descends into water, but they manage to pry the doors open. They're in a metal tank full of submerged, rotting corpses, but at least they're able to surface and get some air. And those corpses are like the first kind of really gross horror type effect we get, and I feel like they're really effective. They have that rotting flesh thing that does... Yeah, kind of for people who may not have seen this movie but have seen other pop culture things, the rotting flesh that comes off of the people in the bog in Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. That type of, you know, they've been submerged underwater long enough that they've gone through all of the cycles, like the bloat and all the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> to the point where it's, it's just, yeah. I feel like I'm over describing. Let's talk more this. about rotting flesh. Let's talk less about it, actually. <laughs> okay. I would prefer more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the only reason I'm here. Otherwise, I'm leaving. I'm just here to talk about rotting flesh. <laughs> Jack and Wang are taken to another torture room and put into Victorian style wheelchairs, where Rain pelts them with red balls before revealing some swoon worthy hair. They are blindfolded and taken to a room full of Buddhas to meet an ancient and disgusting looking Lil Pan who they don't recognize and think is just some old guy. Once again, Jack is focused on finding his truck, but Wang stays on point, asking about Miao Yin. Lo Pan wants to know all of the details. Is she from Hunan? Is her dad a holy man? The important things. He tells them that he wants to use her to rule the universe from beyond the grave, which he can apparently do by marrying her to appease his demon, Ching Dai, and become young and powerful again. But before he can continue, he spots trouble on his security cameras. Gracie and Margot have turned up, dragging Eddie along with them, and are trying to use the threat of bad press to get a tour of the facility. Lo Pan storms off, at least as much as you can when you're a 2,000-year-old man in an electric wheelchair. Jack and Wang are taken to another murder room with skeletons, and Thunder appears to give the ladies and Eddie a tour. He leads them into yet another trick elevator that fills with poisonous smoke, knocking them out. Well, also makes you wonder, do they have any normal elevators in the building at all? Or are yeah. they all just trick elevators? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are also escalators. I feel like this is very much a mall layout. And very mm -hmm. long ramps for wheelchair access. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. I do love that wheelchair scene, though, where he almost mm -hmm. goes down the well and has to, like, wrench himself back up. Meanwhile, Jack has knocked over his chair and is cutting himself free with a knife hidden in his boot. He unties Wang, but someone is coming, so they get back in the chairs and fake it. Thunder brings in a semi-conscious Eddie, and while he's distracted hanging Eddie up on a hook on the wall, Jack and Wang attack him. They don't do especially well, but they manage to escape with Eddie and lock Thunder in the room. Things are going haywire, so Lopan takes on his immortal ghost demon form with long pinky nails and goes to visit Miao Yin, who is also floating around unconscious in a sheer iridescent caftan. The most beautiful dress. The in most the beautiful dress. <laughs> it really is, too. It's a very pretty fabric. Sheer and floaty, which works well for literally floating around rooms. This is also where I think I started to notice some of the inconsistencies with David Lopan's ghost form mm -hmm. because there are times where he can and can't touch things can and can't <laughs> hit people hand things to people 
stuff like that. But in this scene specifically, he's like, I can't touch you, but then goes right for the boobies. Yeah. And <laughs> just checking. I mean, maybe that's Lopin's weakness. <laughs> yeah. He can touch lots of things, but not boobless. Yeah, the hornier he is, the less his powers work. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's <it>. Yeah. <laughs> While trying to escape, Eddie, Wang, and Jack find a floor where a bunch of women are being held in cages including Margot, who is busy journaling, and Gracie, who has been hogtied for being a wildcat. Jack frees the women, though it's a goddamn miracle he doesn't accidentally kill any of them while shooting at all of the locks. As they run away from the guards and Thunder, who escape from the murder room, they find a cistern full of water with large pipes leading out, and they have no choice but to swim for it. Luckily, they surface into a series of overflow pipes, and this is when Jack chooses to kiss Gracie, all because she's glad he didn't die. But to be fair, she was pretty glad. The group finds a ladder, leading up to a grate, and climbs out of the sewers into a dusty storeroom. Jack is confident they'll be able to walk out easily from here and opens the door, but there are men waiting on the other side to kill them. Jack shoots some of them, but Wang's hardcore martial arts skills are really what does it, and then they all escape out of the front lobby into Egg's waiting tour bus. Well, almost all. A door opens and a hairy arm grabs Gracie. The tour bus peels out, but it isn't long before Jack realizes that Gracie isn't with them. The hairy arm belongs to a truly terrifying monster that is a great reminder that John Carpenter has a horror background. It takes her to a chamber where Rain, Thunder, and Lopan come in and see that she has green eyes too. Lopan is thrilled and decides to see if he can marry her too. She's raging with the fire of a thousand suns, but he finds it all so cute and even tries to tickle her under her chin, which women love. (laughs) It was a very creepy... He makes a little noise. Tick-a-tick-a-tick. Tick-a-tick-a-tick. <laughs> yeah, it's a moment. Meanwhile, our band of heroes now includes the Chang Sings, and the whole lot of them are working their way into Lopan's compound through the sewer system. Up top, Thunder and Rain are giving a martial arts demonstration in front of Lopan and zombified Gracie and Miao Lin. At the end of Rain's performance, he gives the women two swords that begin to glow and rise into the air. When they have both demonstrated that they can, quote, master the burning blade, the double wedding is on. The sewer system dumps them into a room with a big pile of fish, which I loved. They were like emergency provisions, like this room temperature piled fish. With a hole directly into the sewer system. I know, right? Like, what? It was good enough for the Chang Sing, too. One of the guys just like, as soon as he got in there, just picked one up bit the head off and was like hey jack (laughs) you want some you want a bite yeah i mean and the funny thing to me is like the pile of fish is under the pipe which of course makes sense from a production perspective because they need something to land on but does it imply that the fish have come from the sewer system like Mm. they somehow worked their way there and fell out of that pipe and then the provisions (laughs) are possibly the things on the shelves what logistically is happening? I don't think there's any way to save this just because <laughs> looking at that pile of fish, it was never going to pass code. Yeah. The funny thing, it implies that the Wing Kong are terrible at pantry organization. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What they should have done is gotten Gracie Law to call a food inspector and get it shut down. That's how they save everybody. <laughs> that would have been, that was a much better plan, actually. But that's not what they do. Egg explains that Lopan must sacrifice his bride to break his curse, but Egg has a plan and has prepared a potion to give them all special powers and strength. They make it into a hallway with a bunch of warrior statues and narrowly miss some guards, only to be accosted by a floating eyeball monster guardian that Egg addresses as Lopan. Sure enough, Lopan can see them through its eyes and tells Egg his plans completely unsolicited. He will marry both women, then sacrifice Gracie to appease the Emperor, but keep Miao Yin to, quote, live out his earthly pleasures. Vomit. Jack tries to shoot the eyeball monster, which scares it away. They make it to Lopan's office, but he is gone. More specifically, he has joined his brides, entourage, and lower-level henchmen in what looks like a rave cellar with a pretty awesome decor of classical Chinese stonework outlined in neon, complete with a mall escalator descending from the mouth of a skull, which is amazing. A hundred thousand percent I would want to have a rave there. Jack, Wang, Egg, and crew find a hollow area behind a wall and bust through to find yet another elevator that only goes down. Before they take it, the whole crew takes Egg's special potion and Wang toasts to the colors that never run, making special mention of the army and navy, because fuck you, Coast Guard. They take the (laughs) elevator... Thank you. I'm not at all surprised that Wang as a character would say this. It's just more like, why did this get so much airtime is his toast. To the colors that never (laughs) run... Thank you to the Army and Navy. And the battles that they Yeah, won. exactly. There's like a whole other line. It's just more like, have you served? It feels like there's more behind it for Wang. Like, I want to know why he put so much into that toast. 
They take the elevator down just in time to see Lopan poke Miao Yan with, no joke, the needle of love. It works, and he's thrilled to see that he's bleeding. <laughs> now that he's flesh and blood, our heroes attack. Wang skewers the eyeball guardian and goes flipping off into the melee while Jack shoots the ceiling and knocks himself out cold with falling rocks. <laughs> I love that moment. And that moment is kind of like the iconic, what you're talking about, Mason, where it's, he's here to be fun, not to be a hero. Yep. <laughs> you know, He tries. He tries to be a hero, and he does ultimately actually kill Lopan, but... Although Jack would probably have zero doubts about himself being the hero. That's exactly what I was just about to ask, is in his mind, did this go down so differently where he's the one that saved the day and did all the heavy lifting and all that stuff and everybody else was just chaos, but he was the one that actually made the plan come together. That's a question that we'll never unfortunately have an answer to, unless we can get Kurt Russell on here. Okay, once again, we have a rumble between the rival gangs. Gracie goes off to fight an absolutely gleeful Lopan as he keeps poking Miao Yin. Wang fights Rain of the Silky Hair, and Jack eventually regains consciousness. Lopan and Egg Shen finally come head to head and battle it out with astral projected warriors that come from beams of light they shoot out of their pinky nails, I think? Lopan does, and then Egg has like a little diamond. Yeah. Is it one of those little purple diamonds he's got? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what Egg is using. Okay. I think shooting energy out of your nail implies evil. Oh, okay. So evil (laughs) magic comes out of pinky fingers. Yeah. Good magic comes out of purple diamonds. Got it. Yeah, it's science. It's science. It's science. Lopan wins, but nothing actually happens to Egg, so maybe it was just for fun. That was something that I didn't notice the first time around, is they do this whole big astral projection fight. Zero stakes. Zero stakes. Nothing happens after. Just rock'em, sock'em, boppers, and nothing happens. And then I think Lopan says, you never were able to beat me. And it's like... Yeah, exactly. At this fun game that we play. (laughs) But you haven't beaten him either, Lopan. Yeah. 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 You just fought each other in your imaginations, essentially. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Lopan and Thunder try to escape up the escalator with Miao Yen, and Wang follows. Gracie and Jack take the elevator, sparing a few moments for messy kissing on the way, and Jack comes away with some very red lipstick all over his mouth and teeth. When they emerge into the office, Wang has Thunder all tied up. Not technically tied up, for the record, like tied up fighting. And, I mean, you guys know that, but just in case it wasn't clear. And Lopan is cornered. Jack, ever charismatic but not a great shot, throws his knife at Lopan and misses. Lopan picks it up and throws it back, but Jack, in the luckiest moment of his life, catches it and flips it back at Lopan, hitting him in the forehead and killing him, and setting off a domino effect of golden plaster Buddhas. That scene always made me curious because, like, the first shot is so bad, but the (laughs) reflexes and then the second shot is so good that I couldn't tell if, like, the first one was on purpose because after he throws the first shot... Lopan releases Miao Yin. Yeah. And then... To go pick up the knife. Then he, you know, yeah, to go pick up the knife and then throws it back. And so I was wondering if it was maybe, Mm. like, to get Miao Yin away from him and then free up a good shot. That's a good question. Because it would have been maybe too dangerous to throw a really accurate shot or, you know, try to throw an accurate shot when Miao Yin was so close to him. I don't know. It's a theory. All right. Interesting theory. I wouldn't have thought he was either smart or skilled enough for that, but that's a really valid theory. Yeah, but (laughs) I'm going to say that and then immediately debunk my own theory, which is if his second (laughs) shot was so good, why couldn't that have been the first shot? So, Right. But it might have just been like, didn't have the confidence in having two people in such close proximity. I'm going to go to our expert panel of Rachel and see what she thinks. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Hello. So I don't understand what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you think that Jack faked his bad first throw in order to oh, get no. Lopan to release Miao Yin? No, I don't feel like Jack is someone with that kind of pre-planning ability. Okay. You know, like, he <laughs> yeah. went That's for fair. it. <laughs> it didn't work. And then he got extremely lucky. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I don't think he's capable of that kind of subterfuge. I, I gave him too much credit then. <laughs> I kind of like that you gave him the... You're like, you know, maybe he had a plan here. (laughs) He's got a heart of gold. I do that a lot of times when we're doing movies like this. And it really should be like the Occam's Razor thing. But I also just try to give people outs or give them more credit than they deserve. Yeah, I think it's nice. I don't know. (laughs) I think it's nice. We're almost at the end of this thing, I swear to God. When Thunder sees Lopan dead, he blows up like the ant in that one Harry Potter movie and then explodes. Now it's Lightning's turn. I think, and this is both written, but also something I'm just going to say 
naturally because this is my personal conspiracy theory about this movie. I think Lightning is secretly on their side because <laughs> the whole time he really hasn't hurt them. And then now, like mm-hmm. when they're escaping, he takes so much time to like yeah. mm-hmm. show off his Lightning and walk over. And then, so they're escaping through a hole in the ceiling. Jack's feet go up through the hole. And it's like, as only his feet are showing that lightning takes one shot and misses. And then they go up the hole and then they're in another floor. And then there's another hole in the ceiling. And once again, lightning comes, only takes one shot, this time at Wang, and again misses. (laughs) So like, we have seen him do crazy things with that lightning. We know he can be really accurate and he is not. And I think it is because he wants to be on their team. Interesting. I had written down that Lightning wastes just an insane amount of energy doing the showmanship stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think with Lightning, to me, it sort of feels like, you know how when, say, like an Olympic figure skater, when they're done competing as Olympians, they go and do like ice capades? Mm. (laughs) So it's... it's... The feel- so lightning is the Michelle Kwan of the three storms. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the feeling that I get is he's like, listen, I have these skills. I need a place to use them. Is this the ideal place? No. Am I going to find accommodations that make me feel a little bit better about where I can get paid to do the thing I'm good at? Yeah. So, like, maybe he's just there to show off and not really to kill. Yeah, he's not a fighter. He's a performer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, and so the other two are killed outright. One of them explodes, and then... Rain. What happens to Rain? Remind me. He gets stabbed by Wang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, yeah, Wang throws the sword at him while he's flying through the air. But Lightning gets bonked on the head. He does, yeah. And, like, we don't actually see it. Exactly. Off frame, maybe he was like, oh, no, I got bonked. I guess I'm out of commission. So maybe that does kind of play into your theory. So the only question now is who's in love with Lightning? (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's Mason. Yeah. (laughs) He's my favorite, which just hints all of this ridiculous speculation (laughs) that I'm doing. Okay. We're all, I'm going to do it. Okay. So blah, blah, blah. Do it. They climb up, they climb up through another hole in the ceiling and lightning misses again. The one shot he takes before they drop something on his head, which seems to do the trick. As Jack, Gracie, Egg, Wang, and Meow run through the building to escape, they find Jack's truck in a warehouse and use it to bust through the doors and out onto the street. They make it back to the restaurant safe and sound, and as they celebrate, Egg slips out the back to take a long and well-deserved vacation. Romance is in the air. Margot and Eddie flirt. Wang and Miao Yin seem happy to be together, and Gracie recommends that Jack get a bigger truck so they can go on the road together. Girl, you are a lawyer. Jack says he rubs everyone the wrong way eventually, but he'll think about it. Back in the Pork Chop Express, Jack is once again monologuing over the CB radio, but guess what? The hairy monster has hitched a ride on the back of his truck. The end. Oh. Holy Lord. I'm glad that's done. <laughs> so, apologies. That's a lot to explain. It mm-hmm. is. So, what do you think about introducing a new section called Obscure Stats with Mason? Whoa. Oh, I like it. Okay, cool. I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a trivia thing, and since we have two people, there can be a winner and a loser. Oh, no. Okay. Dibs on loser. As of today, (laughs) as of recording, how many acting credits does James Hong have listed in IMDb? Oh, my God. You're not allowed to Uh, look. I'm not looking. 148. 149. (laughs) Okay. Well, (laughs) Rachel automatically wins because she is closer. Yes. Uh, (laughs) However, the correct answer is... 452. Holy shit. 452 Holy acting fuck. credits. Holy fuck. That's voice acting. Get it to him, James Hall. Plus person acting, but it's insane. Person He's acting. so prolific. I mean, that is insane because I was trying to go with like a big, big number because uh-huh. he has worked so much and I didn't even like 452. <laughs> wow. Good on you, dude. Emily, would you like to know another obscure set, Emily? <laughs> uh, Mason, yes I would, Mason Okay, great So do, do you know the number of times that Wang says Jack in this movie Because we, I think, all noticed not only that he says Jack a lot But he will oftentimes say it twice in one sentence Jack, first I gotta go somewhere, Jack And so while we were watching, I wrote down that I needed to go back and actually count How many times Wang Holy says shit. Jack did you in do it? 
I did. You yourself count it. Oh my I god. I did myself count. Okay. And not all of them are in the script. It wasn't like a control F on the script to figure this out. Some of them don't register in the closed captioning. So this is my best <laughs> number that I could come up with. Do you have a guess? Oh, God. Considering that the movie itself is only about 100 minutes long. Okay. Where do you think we land? Oh. At least twice. At least twice. <laughs> At least twice. <laughs> Rachel wins. Hey, I get to guess too. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go 50. Okay. So it's in between 2 and 50, hopefully. Wait, was that Rachel's actual guess? I don't know. You get another chance <laughs> if you want to revise your guess, Rachel. Okay. Thrice. Thrice. <laughs> okay. No, it is 61. He oh, says my God! Jack 61 times so in a 100-minute movie. So. <laughs> Holy shit. 61, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's impressive. That is not counting times that he says Jack talking about Jack. This is just talking oh to Jack. Oh, okay. So when he is calling out Jack's name or talking to Jack in like a one-on-one -on -one setting, he says Jack's name to him 61 times. Wow. Maybe Kurt Russell was just having a really hard time on set remembering his name. Yeah. And he was like, do me a solid. <laughs> just say my name. Someone's got to keep him on track. <laughs> keep throwing it out there so that I can stay in character. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that theory. I mean, yeah, that's crazy. And I am amazed that you counted and impressed. Nothing or devil. How many people <laughs> do you think were killed fictitiously in this movie? Ooh. Rachel, you have a guess? Or should I? I'm going to go with a handful. <laughs> <laughs> so at least five. At least five. Okay. Very safe guess. We know at least the two of the three storms. I would assume they're going to count the three storms. So that's at least three people. And then like a bunch of people. Le Pan himself as well. Le Pan himself as well. So I'm going to go with 37. The correct answer is 46. Oh, I wasn't that far. So I was right. I wasn't that far. You, <laughs> That's a handful. you were right. At oh. least a handful. Technically right is the best kind of right. Correct. You know, it all depends on how big your hands are. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> and thus ends this segment of Skier Stats with Mason. It's a very short okay. section, but like I'm it. hoping in the future that it will get longer. I like it. I like it. Yeah, there was a lot of interesting esoterica, I guess, with this movie. <laughs> Going through some of the trivia facts that I could find, one piece of trivia that I thought was particularly fun. So, you know, Eggshen's tour bus? Mm -hmm. That vehicle is a 1936 white touring car, is what it's called, apparently. That specific car is now at Yellowstone, giving tours of Old Faithful. <laughs> huh. Yeah, and its name Very is Hollywood. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is the fourth movie that Kurt Russell and John Carpenter did together, by the way. Mm -hmm. Including, Rachel, have we talked about this one? Escape from New York? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's Over a fun... text, at least, yeah. Yeah, that is a fun movie. Snake Pliskin. He comes out of the egg thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's the biggest thing I remember from it. Also, another trivia fact, sets from this movie were reused in a Janet Jackson music video. Oh, which which one? one? If. 1993. If. So oh, I don't even remember that. Look yeah. That up. I like the reuse of the stuff, you know, mm -hmm. the sets being reused in the Janet Jackson video. Speaking of music videos, John Carpenter actually made a music video for the song that he wrote. So he scored this like he did many of his movies, but he also wrote a song called Big Trouble in Little China and then recorded a music video for it with, and this is the best part, some of his filmmaker friends. So the music video itself is just a bunch of middle-aged filmmakers <laughs> pretending to be a band. It's kind of living the dream, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to look that up immediately. Oh, you should. It's everything you would hope it would be. Early on, you know, we were talking about well, a couple of pieces. So like the aspect of this with our more visible protagonist, the Kurt Russell and the Kim Cattrall, you know, are outsiders in this story. And then also that he's not really the hero. He's our window into a lot of stuff, but he's not mm -hmm. really the hero. And apparently those things were very much by design. So John Carpenter has said, and I don't think this is a direct quote, but envision the film as an inverse of traditional scenarios in action films with a white protagonist and then a minority sidekick. So he specifically was like, you know what would be funny? <laughs> Let's flip this and then tell the story that way. And he's right. It's really fun to watch. I think one of the people that made it so fun is James Liu, who was the fight coordinator and choreographer for this movie. He also appears in the movie and 
is a producer of the movie. So he, <laughs> Whoa. his fingerprints are all over it. And there are some very fun fight scenes in this, especially when you mix in kind of like the mysticism, the drinking meth or whatever, you know, <laughs> you get some really fun <laughs> times in the rave basement that you were talking about. So I really appreciate the work that he put in. He has had a Hall of Fame career, worked with so many incredible people, and it was a treat to have him handpicked by John Carpenter to work on this movie. Yeah, he did a fantastic job, and there are so many fantastic fight moments. We didn't talk about the possible menu of Wang Chi's restaurant, which I think oh, was called Dragon of the Black Sea. Yes, mm-hmm. and it was specifically <laughs> Cantonese. I noticed that for sure. Yeah, because you see everyone nibbling on stuff, and then there's the sewer storage room full of fish. But, like, <laughs> I always want to know what kind of stuff they serve. Yeah. <laughs> Whether that's a restaurant worth going to. They have bowls of noodles. And then, actually, it's interesting because in the script, there are more notes about the food itself. So, like, as I was just scrolling mm-hmm. through looking for something, I would notice them mentioning dishes. And both watching this movie and researching this movie has made me very hungry. <laughs> Here's a note that I took in its entirety. Thunder doesn't know where to put his emotions, so he just blows up like a balloon. Yeah. <laughs> As it turns out, a lot of Chinese demons need therapy. <laughs> yeah. Kurt Russell turned down the lead role of Connor McCloud in Highlander to appear in this movie. So he made this instead of Highlander. And that's why we have Christopher Lambert and his non-English speaking performance of that role. <laughs> Christopher Dunn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's a good trait. And Sean Connery oh, is like a, a Spanish gross. guy, right? Yes, he is. I'm not Spanish. I'm Egyptian. A lot of people love Highlander. I'm from Spain. <laughs> <laughs> If I were an actor, I would much rather be remembered as somebody that was in Big Trouble in Little China than Highlander. Yeah. Highlander Mm -hmm. takes itself a little too seriously at times, and this one does not. And so I would feel much better about being tied to this movie. Takes itself too seriously at all the times, you might even say. Yeah. I think there are some comedic moments, but... I mean, fair enough. But yeah, Highlander is not one of my personal favorites. One thing about Highlander that always jumps out to me when I think about it is Christopher Lambert did not speak English at all. So he memorized his lines phonetically and delivered them phonetically. Mm -hmm. And that's why it sounds insane. Mm, Interesting. But I agree with you. I would rather be remembered for this movie than Highlander. I mean, they're both memorable in their own ways. And I know that Highlander is iconic for a lot of people, but just in a very different direction. Yeah. You guys remember during the watch of the movie, I was trying to figure out what Kurt Russell was doing with his voice. And I don't remember what I said. I think just sort of very Midwestern plus possibly a John Wayne impression. So Mm -hmm. I was not wrong because Kurt Russell said that he based Jack Burton on John Wayne. So kudos to me. (laughs) Sorry. That just makes me want to say, well, he got it really wrong. (laughs) He maybe did, but Uh. I was picking up on something. That's all I'm you saying. were, you were. I just don't see Jack Burton as a John Wayne type character. Uh-huh. Lance, can you please put in here a <laughs> clip of Jack Burton sounding as John Wayney as you can find him? You just listen to the old pork chop express here now and take his advice on a dark and stormy night when the lightning's crashing and the thunder's rolling and the rain's coming down and sheets thick as lead. Just remember what old Jack Burton does when the earth quakes and the poison arrows fall from the sky and the pillars of heaven shake. Yeah, Jack Burton just looks that big old storm right square in the eye and he says, give me your best shot, pal. I can take it. Or did he mean for Jack Burton to be kind of what John Wayne thought of himself (laughs) in a way? Like Mm. this bombastic, you know, alpha male tough guy who really wasn't. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I mean, maybe, you know. Listen, I'm going to interpret it in just the voice because that's what works for me. (laughs) But I like like the expanded. That's a more meaningful theory than mine, for sure. I mean, any chance I get to shit on John Wayne, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. He deserves it, so. Maybe that was the idea. Maybe it's not a bad John Wayne impression. It's a... An accurate John Wayne impression. An accurate John Wayne impression. Yeah. (laughs) One more... It's not really a point in favor of the John Wayne thing. It's just more of like a side point. Apparently in the DVD commentary for the movie, which unfortunately I didn't get to watch because I got it on Amazon, but in the DVD commentary, the story was originally written as a Western, but John Carpenter decided to set it during modern times. And instead of the truck, it was going to be his horse that was stolen. (laughs) Okay. I like this version better. (laughs) Me too. So since I have become known or marked out a little niche for myself in the obscure fact (laughs) realm, 
So if you remember at the beginning of the movie, when the three storms are first introduced, there is a shot of them throwing knives at the people that are shooting at them. And at first I thought they were Bowie knives because they actually like have this weird shape to them, kind of like a Bowie knife. Yeah, they're Mm -hmm. curved. Yeah, they're curved. But that is not the case. They are in fact called, ooh. (laughs) 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 Hui Huan Du, which are soul returning blades and are in fact Nepalese Kukri. Isn't that what Thunder yelled right before they threw their knives? Oh, is that true? Okay, so I missed Ooh. that. But, okay, that makes so much more sense now. Discovering things in the moment. <laughs> they heard the knives that are used by all the military regiments in the British Indian Army. And so aren't really from hmm. that area, but were repurposed and... Do look cool. <laughs> do look cool. The storms know a good weapon when they... Exactly. <laughs> they, yeah. they don't judge where it came from. You don't get to be one of the three storms if you don't know your weapons. <laughs> Speaking of niches, I feel like I have carved out a little bit of a niche for myself with the alternate casting. One piece for this movie that I thought was pretty funny is they initially wanted to hire Jackie Chan to play Wang, but apparently Mm. the producer was, (laughs) quote, highly against it (laughs) because (laughs) we love Jackie Chan on this podcast, but he was worried that his English wasn't going to be good enough. And that's a big part of how Dennis Dunn was cast because, of course, he's a native English speaker. So, yeah, I mean, you know, bummer for Jackie Chan. His career survived. His career survived. I am from the future, and I can say that his career survived this hit. Yeah, and it's nice. I think Dennis Dunn does bring a little bit of definitely a different vibe. Like, he kind of has this, Mm -hmm. I don't know, almost like a sharper kind of vibe about him, where he's keeping Jack on his toes. He's popping out skills we didn't know he had. It's almost like he enjoys surprising people. You know, Jackie Chan is such a wonderfully goofy performer. I feel like the whole idea of making this less of a white hero with Asian sidekick and making it Asian hero with white sidekick, it works better when you have someone who's less goofy. And if you had Jackie Chan in that main role, I wonder if it would have come up differently. Well, it would have for Mm -hmm. sure. And we can evidence that by looking at the Rush Hour movies, for example. Mm -hmm. Also, Shanghai Noon. Yes. His type of humor, I think, lends itself more to that type of film so and he's that way in real life too when you watch interviews with him he enjoys being he's a class clown for sure because like in interviews he's trying to make people laugh and he's telling funny stories that are self-deprecating he just found a sweet spot in those kind of roles so i'm sure he would have been wonderful but i'm glad that dennis ended up doing it other alternate casting kurt russell was the director's first choice was not the producer's first choice They actually were interested in some elder statesmen of films of this type. (laughs) Elder statesmen. What does that mean? Like Michael Douglas? Diane Feinstein? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. No, okay. Now I'm just like directly quoting IMDb. Although Kurt Russell was John Carpenter's only choice for the lead role, the studio suggested Jack Nicholson or Clint Eastwood. Ew. I know, right? When they proved unavailable, Carpenter was then able to cast Russell. So he wanted him and he'd worked with him three times before, but the studio was like, I don't know, how about Clint Eastwood? (laughs) No, thank you. Gross. Yeah, not a fan. Yeah, absolutely not. Immediate pass. Yeah, and Jack Nicholson, okay, he would have been much younger, of course, at that point. So I don't know that it's fair to call him an elder statesman in 1986, but Clint Eastwood was for sure. I have a thing. Oh, (gasps) go for it. Sorry, we got so excited. (laughs) I, as of this episode, have carved out a niche for myself as being woefully unprepared but willing to proceed anyway. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) But one thing that I noticed, and my sister's noticed too because she's watched this as much as I have, but... Gracie Law, you know, when she's, I guess, forcibly engaged to Lo Fan mm-hmm. and dressed up alongside Miao Yin in their bridal wear, she has this beautiful sort of peacock headdress mm-hmm. that they put mm-hmm. on her, you know, as opposed to Miao Yin's pearl one with the little like strands that dangle down. Have either of you watched Firefly? Yes! yes. Oh show? boy, you okay. found your audience with that. <laughs> <laughs> so in the episode Shindig, a Firefly, where they go to the ball and, you know, like Kaylee's dressed up mm-hmm. as like a wedding cake, essentially. There's a woman at that ball that Inara talks to saying like, oh, you look lovely, dear. She's wearing the same exact <gasps> peacock headdress. And I noticed it like immediately the first time I ever watched that episode. Oh I was like, oh, that's Gracie Laws. <gasps> you give it back. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I don't know if that's intentional or if maybe someone inherited the piece somewhere or, you know, Big Trouble in Little China being apparently like the pinnacle of sustainability (laughs) passing all of its things on yes i mean i was surprised to see it there but i mean like you know i don't know that much about joss whedon other than Mm -hmm. problematic in recent years 
But I wouldn't be surprised if maybe he's got a lot of influence from John Carpenter. Yes. And that was like a little nod to it, or if like, if that was their wardrobe person's nod to yeah. it. But I thought that was a really neat detail discovered years and years later, but I haven't been able to find anyone mentioning anyone. Ooh, so. Ooh okay. Yeah. You know what, though? <laughs> that is something that I can get screenshots of, because now I own this movie and mm-hmm. I definitely also own Firefly. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's in the episode Shindig. I think. Oh, man. I do love that episode because it's just sort of all about how sweet she is and she just wants to go and enjoy it. And then those mean girls are mean to her and mm-hmm. it's a sweet one. There's also an interesting parallel in John Carpenter's exploration of this microcosm of Chinese American culture and Chinatown and things like that. And what Firefly does in this sort of like white dude's interpretation of a future universe where people speak Chinese, mm-hmm. but there's almost a complete absence of Chinese people in it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just like these heroes kind of going along and like participating or partaking in this enormous cultural linguistic practice, mm-hmm. but like the people from whom they took it are not there. Yeah. yeah. And comparing that to what John Carpenter's done and his intentional use of Chinese, Chinese American people as the main heroes and sort of the main characters like in the story instead of a backdrop to be used. Kind yeah. Of. Hmm. Which I think is interesting. Like, I mean, I mean, I'm not surprised that Joss Whedon would do something yeah. like that, but it doesn't look extremely great in comparison, especially if he's drawn some inspiration from Big Trouble in Little China. That is yeah. really an interesting point. I don't know. I think of it as like the J.K. Rowling effect, but you could also easily kind of have it be the Joss Whedon effect where it's like once you start learning big bad things about people, you start noticing like, oh, maybe I should have. Yeah, I should have paid more. Okay. Yeah, I should have paid more attention. <laughs> you yeah. know? So I remember like at the time, like I loved yeah. Firefly and then you start thinking about it and you're like, you know. I should probably not love it as much as I do. (laughs) It's really hard. And it's hard because, like, I'll support Gina Torres doing anything at all ever. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, like, watching it again now, as opposed to when it first came out or when I first discovered it, I'm just kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, a lot of the magic is sort of dimmed. Yeah, and dimmed (laughs) is right because, like, for me personally, at least, there are a lot of people involved in making something. So, like, you brought up Gina Torres, and, and like, 100%, any time that I see anyone from a show like that that I love, I'm, you know, of course, like, oh, my God, I wrote Firefly, I love it. The production people, the set designers, like, so many people were involved in making that the thing we love. Yeah, just making a living. Yeah, and it's really hard to be like, I don't want to just unquestioningly continue to love something created by somebody who has done some pretty bad things. But I also Mm -hmm. don't want to disrespect the many other people who are involved in making the thing that I love. You know, Mm -hmm. like if you were the costume designer on Firefly, would you want all of the fans to be like, well, fuck Firefly, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it's rough. It's rough. But anyway, aside from all of that, that is a fantastic pickup. And I'm going to go find screenshots of those two things and do a side by side. Well, you know, I think that is about all that I know to say, except Rachel, thank you so, so much for joining us and for spending so much time, honestly, like talking about watching and then talking about again, this movie that I know you have seen so many times, but it's been an absolute delight to get to watch it again with you and talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Say hi to your mom. I will. (laughs) (laughs) I know for a fact that here's what she'll say back. Oh, Rachel, I love Rachel. Tell her I said hi. (laughs) Mom is also an avid listener, so I'm sure she'll hear that and be like, yeah, I mean, my voice isn't that high, but that's pretty much what I would say. Mason. Yes. The next film is a big one for us. It is. It is, in fact, our season finale. We are coming to an end on season one. Twelve wonderful episodes will be capped off with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Holy shit. It's the mother load. It really is. We know that this is on a lot of people's top adventure movies, and we had to save it for last just so that we could look at other influences in the genre before setting out with that and comparing everything to it. We didn't think that that was going to be super fair for a lot of movies. So we have selected it as our last movie for season one. And then, of course, we will have more of the Indiana Jones series in future seasons. So please watch our socials at The Adventurelings on social media and theadventurelings.com. You can also email us with criticisms, (laughs) facts that we missed, how much you liked Rachel and would rather have her on the show than either of us. All at <laughs> theadventurelings at gmail.com. We just abandon the show and like hand over the podcast to Rachel. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's, make it whatever you want. I'll do the sign off. <gasps> do the sign off! Yeah! Yay, yay, yay. Okay. 
As always, thank you for listening. Please send us money and nudes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not even going to roll that back. If we get any actual nudes, we'll address it then. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Did you survive? No. Oh, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> We're doing it again, Lance. <laughs> We're doing it again, Lance. <laughs> Already used intense once in this sentence. Sensual? No. <laughs> Rachel? <Fine>. No. <laughs> no, it's still not sensual. Lactose intolerant? <laughs> Usually you say something, and in my head I say, that sounds professional. Yeah, okay. Jack and Wang. Jack and Jack. <laughs> Jack and Wang, egg and crew. Now we have an egg in the situation where you're Jack and Jack and Jack Wang. Jack and Wang and egg and crew. You're getting oh. close to. Are we being trolled? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna sing it. Never mind. No. <laughs> They're interrupting. Dim dim dim. Find off. <laughs> Mike okay. Yeah. Mike okay. Mike okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm really interested in trying to pick up more on. Moron. <laughs> Let's try that again. Don't know where I was going with that. That's a thing that happened. This doesn't need to be in the podcast. <laughs> Adios, muchachos. <laughs>